a lot of what you hear is going to be something new. Some of it might even sound, oh, a bit conspiratorial. But today we're going to look at the winners, losers, and many of the human health and ecological implications of geoengineering and other related programs. There's evidence which is very abundant that geoengineering programs have been started. One of those is stratospheric aerosol geoengineering. And that's the idea of taking airplanes or other sources and creating an artificial cloud cover to block the sun and mitigate this issue of global warming. And they're a very effective way to consolidate both monetary and political power into the hands of a few at the expense of many things on our planet that we value, such as human health, ecosystems, many other things. Why me? I often ask that. I guess it's a calling. It's something that's on my heart. As a child, I had what would seem like a normal type of environment, privileged and to some degree upper middle class neighborhood. I was, I was different than most children. I was very daring. I would go into social and other situations that most people would not. And I lacked that fear. There was a curiosity that, that drove me outside of school. I was the daring kid in the, in the neighborhood that would be asked to, to do things that nobody else wanted to do. My whole life, I heard you're going to be a great salesman. You're great with people. You have to go into sales. Well, I went into sales, and I was good. And there were a lot of things involved with that life. Nice cars, a nice home, stability. But I didn't have my soul. I wasn't operating in my calling. And that led to a dark road, to me neglecting my work and eventually leaving my career. Through great adversity, through great challenge, through my family and friends turning their back because I was not the Michael Murphy that they loved. I was not who they wanted me to be. I was turning into who I was. Walking away from corporate America, losing my house, getting a divorce. I think that all was in part a turning point. For the first time in my life, I started questioning things. It became very clear to me that what I was really good at was serving people, was serving communities, community organizing. My community work started in workforce development on the south side of Chicago, helping underprivileged people, gang members, people out of prison get jobs. And I began to see the heart of my clients and, and how desperately they were trying to get minimum wage jobs and, and make changes in their life and the struggles and challenges that they truly had. And I was told all of these things, don't go into this community, you might get shot, you might be killed. I found it to be the most rewarding job in my life because I was finally changing lives. I started two inner city food banks, one of which is a very large food bank now, and to see something that you've done in a community that's helped so many people out is just incredible. And I feel that's how I knew that I was in my calling. It was just that deep desire. I began the process of making this film after learning about the climate change agenda and what was happening geopolitically. After re great resistance, I didn't believe it, like most people, I think at first, but then, you know, I started to notice, yes, our skies are changing, and I started to get curious. So rather than denying it like I used to do with issues like this, I began to really look into it. And we went to the American Association for the Advancement of Science meeting. We listened to the scientists outline their plans and proposals to geoengineer our skies by spraying chemicals out of airplanes. And, and that's what really opened my mind up to listening to them, just the fact that they were planning on doing this, let alone have currently already started doing this, and the consequences, we're talking about possibly two billion people having their food supply disrupted. Coming from a founder of two food banks, I 
concern me. So just from that issue alone, this is something that needs to be addressed. And we started putting together the first film. The right people came in and we got the right support. And with credible information bringing this forth, it reached millions of people. It's all about money and weather is another form of commoditizing, a way the Central Command Group can commoditize another form of our life. The first two films were geared at raising awareness and educating the public and we woke millions of people up and that was good. However, waking people up is not going to stop this. So this film, Unconventional Grey, it's geared at activating people. It's geared at giving people the knowledge, not only the knowledge at understanding how geoengineering relates to the climate change agenda, but how we need to move forward in stopping this. The signs of climate change are all around us. Sea level rising, melting ice sheets and glaciers, these climate change impacts cascade from ecosystems to people and to the economy. When it comes to geoengineering, the situation is ripe for abuse. There are major uncertainties regarding effectiveness, cost, and environmental impact. And that really goes across essentially all the schemes we deal with. Geoengineering is defined as the artificial modification of the Earth's climate. We take geoengineering to mean deliberate, large-scale intervention in the Earth's system. And that's the idea that you could put mostly reflective particles or other means to make the Earth whiter, effectively to increase the Earth's reflectivity, reducing the amount of heat that's absorbed by the sun, and therefore exerting some overall cooling tendency on the Earth. Geoengineering is deliberate climate change. It's making the experiment that we've been doing accidentally since the Industrial Revolution intentional. The problem with doing that is we don't have a control Earth to, to do an experiment on, right? We, we get one shot. If something weird happens, then we just have to deal with the fallout. We have to be willing to accept these consequences. University scientists talk about geoengineering as if it's some future event. At the beginning, I said that that acceleration management was cheap, fast, and imperfect. The novel method is that we put a condensable vapor directly out of the back of an aircraft. We've been doing a little work on delivery. There's a study that an uh, aircraft engineering firm called Aurora Flight Sciences is doing, and they've been looking at, at a bunch of different delivery options, but the bottom line is that it seems pretty cost-effective and easy to do this with aircraft that are not very different from conventional aircraft. There are various forms of geoengineering. Some geoengineering could be related to ionospheric heating, weather modification, specifically stratospheric aerosol geoengineering is the idea of putting a protective layer over the Earth, reflecting sunlight back into space. Well, all I did was look up. Those aren't clouds, but what are they? And sometimes it's a tic-tac-toe board. It's not a cloud, it's not real. I was in Denver, Colorado, and I saw the, all these trails in the sky. And this is the first time I was aware of such precise trails. I recently had a visitor come from London, and he said, what's that crap in your sky above the clouds? And I asked my friend who lives there, what are those? And she told me planes. I told her, planes do not leave such trails. I mean, they were so evident in that sky, and it was crisp. People think of chemtrails as being contrails, simply water vapor coming out the back of a jet. But that's just not true. Chemtrails do not dissipate. They stay in our sky. A lot of X's in the sky, a lot of parallels, all kinds of cross-hatching. We've had a reduction in sunshine hours. We've had a massive increase in cloud cover. We've seen our skies are no longer really blue. They're like a particulate blue-gray. And ultimately, what we end up with is extremes of weather. It's like uh, always using the future tense in uh, the press about uh, geoengineering. Well, we're thinking of having geoengineering. Perhaps we're going to have to use geoengineering because of the global warming, because of this, because of that. It has already begun. There are various types of programs that go beyond the aerosol trails or what people call the chemtrails. 
their ship-based, we believe, disbursement of these aerosols. And they're responsible for huge weather systems being created out in the Pacific. Something is going on, something so serious that the United States government will never, unless it is forced to acknowledge that it is doing it. Different particles have different effects, but the ones that people have talked about, if you inject them into clouds in, in, over the ocean, they would make the clouds brighter and also reflect more sunlight. Even if you put 10 megatons a year of sulfur in, which is a huge number, by this model you only get about a watt, 0.7, of radiative forcing. Nevertheless, there might be some good reasons to think about alumina. It turns out, first of all, there's been a lot of work on the environmental consequences of alumina in the stratosphere. Alumina has four times the volumetric rate of forcing it for small particles, as does sulfur. And that means you have four times less surface area for the same rate of forcing. And this is a much bigger deal. You have roughly 16 times less the coagulation rate. And that's the thing that really drives removal. But nevertheless, the underlying concern, and the reason that this hasn't been talked about until the last few years, is this so-called moral hazard. What we're finding in rain tests are the exact materials listed and named in a number of geoengineering patents and also listed in a number of geoengineering models. Some of these rain tests, we've seen levels of aluminum, the primary ingredient described in a number of stratospheric aerosol geoengineering programs, escalate as high as 50,000 percentage points. So the numbers have just skyrocketed. I did three analyses spread out over time and on each occasion I had 80 milligrams per litre, which was quite high. Then I had 120 and the other one was 70. That was in line with the realisation that that was a lot of aluminium in the rain. It was disturbing on Maui where a lot of people in certain parts of the island get their water from water catchment tanks. We were measuring samples of the water and found high levels of aluminum, barium, and strontium. We then took those findings to the health department, and the health department conducted rain catchment tests. And what we found was the same average of aluminum, barium, and strontium in the rain catchment we found was the same we were finding in our tanks that people were drinking and using that as their water source. We're finding the same metals worldwide. I'm only working the local area, but everything I've seen, it's uh, aluminum, barium, strontium. The military is spraying another substance into the lower atmosphere. The academics don't mention this because most academics are funded by government grants. When coal is burned by utilities, it produces a heavy ash that settles out a very fine powdered ash that used to go up the smokestack. But it's so toxic that regulations mandated that this fly ash be trapped on electrostatic precipitators. And coal fly ash is ideal because sprayed into the area where weather occurs, which is where jet planes fly, the fine particles are very much enriched in the toxic elements. Mercury, chromium, just a whole suite of them, 40 elements, aluminum being one. It's a toxic nightmare. And that is harmful for everybody, especially pregnant women, especially for children, especially for people who have compromised immune systems or respiratory systems. It's bad for the elderly. On heavy spray days, a lot of people have noticed sinus problems, headache, irritability, nausea. Anytime you put an aerosol up into the sky, it's gonna fall into the air that we breathe. Obviously, we're inhaling this with every breath. With that, it gets into our systems. We've seen diseases that have never been there, the cancers that are coming up day and day. My name is David L. Lewis. I am a research microbiologist, and I worked for the U.S. EPA's Office of Research and Development. 
for over 31 years in blood tests for human beings, tissue tests, we're seeing the elevation over the last few decades of these metals in the human population. And the health consequences associated with that are very serious. Respiratory mortality went from six down to number three in a six year period. We see issues like Alzheimer's, ADD, other aluminum related illnesses that have gone through the roof literally since the full scale deployment of these programs. It's well known that very fine particles make people live shorter lives, birth weights are lower, cancer, autism is increased. Particularly during the early developmental stages of a child, the neurological effects on the brain and its development is of grave concern since the forms of aluminum that are being sprayed into the atmosphere can cross the blood-brain barrier and contact the brain directly and cause damage to the brain cells. This is all, I think, is a result of change of environment, all these toxins that are being sprayed everywhere. It's like a mass genocide that is going on here. People are not prepared for this. Innocent people among us, their health is being damaged, and that is in my view, a crime against humanity. There's something called aerotoxic syndrome. Now, I now have been speaking with doctors and with pilots. Many people are becoming ill. They're getting neurological conditions. They're getting extra fatigue. They're getting higher rate of cancer. Commercial airlines fly pretty much at the same altitude or around where geoengineering programs are taking place. And those have much higher concentrations of aerosols. What they do, they pull in some air into the cabin from outside. So as a result, people are getting a higher concentration of these metals that are coming into the cabin. And we're seeing this issue of aerotoxicity. That's impacting frequent flyers, flight attendants, flight crews, pilots. There are two pilots from British Airways at both age 43 that died in 2012. This is due to aerotoxic syndrome. All the ailments of people who are now unable to fly because they are too ill to fly are consistent with heavy metal toxicity. It's destroying our children's lungs. It's destroying our health. These are programs that are creating death results of climate models indicate that reflection of sunlight away from the earth can offset most climate change in most places most of the time. But it will damage some places. It puts aluminum and other things in chemically mobile forms, soluble in water, so they can get into plants and to animals. And by doing that, you're changing the whole chemical structure of fruits and vegetables and animals and then you're eating toxic food. So the whole thing comes into that science of geoengineering. You've got a tremendous rise in Alzheimer's, not just in humans, in bees. I mean, how can bees be suffering with high aluminium toxicity? Aluminium is ubiquitous. It's all around us, it's in the earth and everything else. It's never caused any problems before, but something has changed. But why should it suddenly start to affect the bees? Or even whales now have been found to have extremely high levels of aluminium toxicity affecting their health. It's causing huge stress, manifesting itself in beetle invasions and in fungus invasions. And all of those are setting back our ecological patterns. It's not normal, of course, the environment is changing, the skies are changing. We have a substance that is being literally poured in the air above us. Rainwater extracts aluminum, and so you have two effects from that. You have the aluminum poisoning of plants, and you have the soil pH being changed, typically making it more alkaline. This is a substance that harms virtually everything. So everything is polluted now. You know, even the crops that we eat and then supposed to be organic, they're not organic. How do you control the skies? Your organic soil is being polluted by what's going up, uh, up there. 
Aluminum makes up about 8% of the Earth's crust, but aluminum is strongly bound to oxygen and to the silicates, so it doesn't move around. And so all of life developed without ever it being exposed to aluminum that could move around. And we have no natural immunity to mobile aluminum, nor do plants. We have tree decline in all areas, even areas that are getting an abundance of rain. Those areas are testing positive for the primary ingredients in geoengineering programs. These programs are about death and destruction. And why? What happens when our forests collapse? That's the lungs of our planet. You can see impacts on all of the trees. There are just tons of dead branches scattered throughout the whole tree, which probably reduced its canopy in half, knocked its life expectancy down probably in half. That's what got me concerned when I was working for Fish and Wildlife, that it's affecting all of our trees that much and the trees aren't gonna live as long. If they're not living as long, and then the, the species that use them are also impacted. This is very common now in the Chicago area. It's about every three or four trees that we're seeing is dead in this community. What we notice in Maui is about a third of our rainforest is actually dead. Geoengineering is changing our weather, and the explanation is that by changing your weather patterns, you're changing what's normal for all of the species that have evolved there. So let's say we were doing geoengineering because we wanted to make the weather a little bit better. Then we'd be balancing some risky geoengineering against the benefits of making the weather a little better, and in my view, the right time to wait until we did that would be infinity. Anytime you put an aerosol into the atmosphere, it's going to affect wind speeds. It's going to affect cloud nucleation. An interesting thing is geoengineers are talking about how if these programs were to be initiated, which they have been, how they will have to utilize and implement weather control and determine where it rains, when it rains, and who specifically gets rain. We're already beginning to see the formation of the center of circulation. My name is Scott Stevens. I studied meteorology at the University of Kansas, and that was my first TV job was on the air was in, in Topeka, and then I uh, worked in Omaha and Tulsa, Albany, New York, and then out into uh, eastern Idaho in the Pocatello, Idaho Falls market for the last 10 years of, of my 20-year career doing weather. It wasn't until about 2005 when I got deep into the weather modification aspect of this story of geoengineering. One of the parts of the program that is very important uh, that plays into the chemtrails is the precision of these actions in the atmosphere. These chemtrails are absolutely required, so they introduce the right en energy at the right location for the right length of time. These trails are wires in the sky. The combined technologies like HARP and the chemtrails were designed to work together as weather weapons. HARP, the High Frequency Active Auroral Research Project, it is filled with phased array antennas. They steer microwaves into the ionosphere where they will activate all of the ions up there. They can use excitation waves that actually affect the metallic particles. So we've ionized the air column. They can heat it, they can cool it. HARP has directional antennas and they can focus their antennas on where they want to move the jet stream and they can hit the jet stream and they create an artificial high. If you accentuate the high, if you amplify a little bit, it's like building a mound of dirt. And you have a little creek or a little stream of water coming. You build the mound of dirt, that water's not going to go through it. So you build the mound, and then that's going to impact storms that are inbound. And so it's very easy to add those particulates of aluminum, barium, and whatever else they want to put in there. And as you add heat to that, those particulates then radiate the heat into the atmosphere, and it warms. And what does a warming atmosphere do? Boom, it expands. We see more intense droughts. We see rainfall rates of one to two and a quarter inches an hour. And sometimes even rainfall, you know, an inch and a quarter a minute is just unheard of. And so when you get the atmosphere capable of conducting this kind of electricity, plus the engineers, you're gonna end up with weather that is extreme. And that's putting it kindly. When they move the jet stream, it then pushes up into the polar vortex. The polar vortex really can only move when there's something impacting it, like HARP. They can heat up that ionosphere. So when the jet stream comes in, it hits that bubble and it diverts. 
the jet stream flow that is normal brings precipitation and brings the jet stream right into California. And then it brings storm systems with it, it brings rain. The jet stream got pushed off of the coast of California. It dried us up and took all our moisture away and pushed the jet stream north. And when it hit the polar vortex, it then was ricocheted straight down the east coast. What we've been getting, very warm, very dry conditions in California, but in terms of the Arctic and in the Midwest, it's swinging all of that moisture, all that cold air. You can kill a storm in place. That's easy to do with heart. You'll see the texture and the structure of the storm just melt, and it will become just this diffuse, amorphous, featureless mess. And that was one of the big epiphanies I had in forecasting. Anticipating a winter storm coming through, you've got a set forecast out that night, and you're waiting for the snow to start. You're waiting for the snow to start, and you're waiting for the snow to start, and it just doesn't. And you go outside and you, you see a warming zone begin to show up on the satellite loops. The clouds literally just begin to warm. And then that collapses the potential of the storm to put down the moisture. It's done. It's shot. When aerosols, heavy metals, whatever type of aerosol it is, when they're introduced into the atmosphere, the water molecules will attach on to these aerosols or metal particulate. So instead of falling naturally, they drift. So we get droughts in certain areas, floods in other areas, exactly what we're seeing right now. There has been precious little water in southern and eastern Africa where El Nino is scorching the earth. In a country like Yemen, we're talking about 100 cubic meters per year. The rainfall has been delayed to an extent that people haven't been able to plant the crops that they need to survive. If you want to destabilize a nation, you can create a drought. And within a couple of months, you're going to have riots. You're going to have destabilization without even firing a weapon. It's an invisible weapon. It is a weapon you can blame on anything. It is something more powerful even than the nuclear war. You can blame this technology on God. You can blame it on nature. Get away with a whole bunch. Think if we had the ability to steer hurricanes and the hurricane was going to slam into New Orleans. And let's say you could steer it so it would hit Mississippi instead. And, and let's say you're going to, instead of killing 1,800 people in New Orleans, you would kill 100 people in Mississippi. And if you do that knowingly, are you murdering those 100 people? And there's all kinds of equity issues there. The moving of the hurricane off of the coast of Florida was done by the Signal Corps, and the U.S. Air Force was flying over it. They thought it was heading out into the Atlantic, and so they dumped dry ice into it. It turned into the coast very quickly. It made a detour and pretty much wiped out Savannah, Georgia. It will be through an active act directly harming people who otherwise wouldn't have been harmed. In this model simulation, there is a reduction in precipitation in this model and in other models in the monsoon region around India. This is obviously a cause for concern because many people live there and depend on that for agriculture. It could change precipitation patterns, change weather patterns in undesirable ways, and there would be winners and losers. Farmers came here and levied in the Sacramento River, and ever since then, agriculture has existed in the area. Because of the abundance and variety that are grown here, it's also an area that produces many, many fruits and vegetables that are easily harvested and easily distributed throughout this area. The state of California is resorting to drastic measures tonight to combat its severe drought. We're in an historic drought, and that demands unprecedented action. It's for that reason that I'm issuing an executive order mandating substantial water reduction across our state. The drought has been going on for four years. We are entering our fifth year. In that time period, we have seen a shift of water rights from the hands of private people, private farmers, into the hands of very large corporate agricultural groups that are buying up water rights silently. A lot of farmers are not getting the water supply. Right now, Jerry Brown, the California governor, he's called for a state of emergency in California. And what that does, it gives him the legal right 
to take any land, and it also gives them the excuse to come in with corporations and corporatize the water. The state is using this drought as a means to take land that doesn't belong to them through eminent domain. They're using this drought as a means to prioritize conveyance to corporate agriculture over the private farmer. This is part of making corporate ag and corporations have more of a priority and more of an importance than the people. The people of the state of California use between 12 and 15 percent of the water in the state compared to corporate agriculture which uses about 85 percent. The water rate increases that the people have been experiencing are out of proportion compared to what corporate ag pays per acre foot for water. All of the burden of this drought is all being placed upon the people of the state of California. Many of the farmers in this valley are not growing because they get allotments from the federal government. It's our water, but the feds own everything. To grow food. What happens then, if land dries, that land is then sold for pennies on the dollar, and then huge agri... The small farmer, if he does not have water, he's in a lot of trouble. The people of the state of California will suffer through restrictions on locally grown fruits and vegetables, higher water rates, and above all, a loss of the public right to water. And that right is being eroded every single time a drought emergency is called. Water is definitely the next oil. Water is definitely going to be the battleground for the next 20 to 50 years. And if we don't get our priorities straight, it will be the consumer, the private person, the public who will be the one suffering. If in fact this drought is being caused by man and is not being caused by nature, then it's a crime against humanity. If we look at geoengineering, what it does, it creates abiotic stress. Abiotic stress is anything that will stress a seed. It's heavy metal contamination, it's too much moisture, it's pH changes in our soil. Natural food is not able to grow very well in this new environment. Monsanto has, quote unquote, come to the rescue because they've developed a genetically modified abiotic stress resistant seed. Terminator seeds do not grow seeds. So what the farmer has to do year after year, they have to go back to Monsanto and purchase these seeds. What they're suggesting is because of a potential climate catastrophe, they're looking to science for answers, but these answers happen to be in line with creating a food monopoly. Nature, or God, gave us everything. Gave us natural seeds, gave us sunshine, and gave us rain to be self-sufficient to feed ourselves. And through the death and destruction of life, seeds being the life. Monsanto comes in, they redesign a seed that will grow in this new environment. Who's the author of life? He comes Monsanto. This is the 1945 modern era of weather control, climate control, that includes proposals to nuke the ice on the poles, to do large-scale cloud seeding, to develop a perfect model that would not have the notion of chaos in it, that would deliver things to the upper atmosphere, maybe to near space. These are the same technologies grown up, developed over the past 70 years or so. There is no doubt that covert weather and climate engineering technologies have been developed for many decades, and they've been used already for geopolitical leverage. The Air Force, in a document, 1996, part of the title was Owning the weather by 2025. The military plans to multiply the force of weather as a weapon. So they're weaponizing weather. And when they say 2025, always assume that it's earlier. The Johnson administration was using weather modification during the 1960s, not only for the Vietnam War, but to alleviate drought in India and Pakistan. Even during World War II, you read some of the history books and stuff, they were desperately concerned. Every battle, they were desperately concerned about the weather and what the weather would be for this battle or that battle or whatever. And they were looking for ways to change the weather pattern to be used against the enemy. Whether it's stratospheric aerosol from airplanes, whether it's a, a ground-based cloud generation, or even additives put in jet fuel, one thing's for sure. 
to achieve the weather modification and other goals of geoengineering, aerosols are required to be in the sky and we're finding these around the world. Weather modification is always played down by the establishment. They try to say it doesn't work, but of course we know it works. They had to bring in the NMOD treaty in 1978 and the Russians petitioned the United Nations to stop the use of weather warfare and eventually the environmental modification treaty came into play. The NMOD treaty had an exemption. While countries are not able to engage in weather modification with other countries, they can engage in weather modification over their own soil. So in developing a weather system, whether it's a drought, whether it's tremendous floods or, or storms, you can start over the United States and work a storm so that it fully matures thousands of miles away, which will have impacts on other countries. So let's say that it works. Again, works means just provides a useful reduction in risk, and we are convinced that it doesn't work. Then we've missed a real opportunity to limit environmental damages, say damages to the high Arctic, which is not a trivial thing. Science had concluded that global cooling was absolutely positively coming, and we need to prepare Back in the 1970s, Stephen Schneider, he was a presidential advisor uh, all the way from Nixon up to President Obama. And he was pushing what he said was a coming ice age. Many of the strategies we see today were attempted in the early 1970s. He looked at putting black carbon on the ice in the Arctic. And the idea is by spraying black carbon, the ice turns black, absorbs more sunlight, and melts. We have pictures now of the Arctic that literally has miles upon miles of what appears to be blacktop, but it's black soot. The carbon black absorbs the radiation from the sun and then it would warm up the clouds. So then you get sprinklings of carbon black and this then would facilitate the melting of ice. Another thing that Steven Schneider proposed doing was putting chlorine into the atmosphere. What chlorine does when you put it into the atmosphere, it destroys the ozone and the idea is to get stronger sunlight. Today we have a huge ozone hole in that region, so it appears that those might have been some of the objectives. And then the Russian government has also detonated over 120 nuclear bombs in that region, some under the ice, and the idea is that gets very hot, obviously melts the ice. The jet stream has been diverting up into the Arctic region, and this diversion has brought warm air from California and the Pacific up into that cold region. That's another way that the Arctic is melting, and we believe that's a direct result of the various jet stream manipulation strategies that we've been watching. With an ice-free Arctic region, they believe that they can make the ice retreat on the land and then expose massive tracts of land which is currently inaccessible. There's 13% of the world's undiscovered oil in the Arctic region. Since that ice has melted, they're starting to pump and get to that ice right now. There was also an issue of shipping lanes. So we now have Russia, the China government, and the United States, they're all up in that region in what appears to be a Cold War scenario where they're jockeying for the shipping lanes. It's a very valuable area for them. The scientists who referenced the melting Arctic ice had blamed it on CO2, and we know that there are a number of factors that led to the melting, probably geopolitical, but definitely geoengineering. So it's a concern of ours that it's missing from climate models. Every instance of odd weather that's being produced is being used as an argument to support global warming. We're going to try to define what kind of climate state we would like to achieve and then give as a task to the engineers to produce the distribution of aerosols that would produce the desired climate state. There's a paper by Edward Teller in 1997 about global warming and ice ages and ultimately he's looking at a system of spraying metallic particles into the atmosphere that then can be stimulated to either warm or cool the planet. When you see the sky being milky or hazy that's probably a sign that there are small particulates in the atmosphere. All of them reflect sun so we get less warming from the sun. Although black carbon is an exception because black carbon also emits heat radiation and has a warming effect. When you increase the canopy of cirrus clouds, you impact the inbound solar radiation. You don't get as warm, but you also don't get as cold at night. If it's a nice sunny day, you'll see trails coming back and forth, back and forth, and the temperature will drop about seven degrees. 
even though it reflects the sun's rays away and therefore tends to cool the daytime temperatures, it still traps the heat that's there during the night and it looks like the total effect or the net effect is a gradual warming of the planet caused by the very geoengineering projects which were sold to us as stopping global warming. We see variations when you're diverting a jet stream of unseasonably cold temperatures in certain regions, unseasonably warm temperatures in other regions, and this is why it's impossible to get an accurate reading of the temperature because we don't have natural circulation. We are definitely getting climate change from the geoengineering program, there's no doubt whatsoever. Whether it's cloud seeding, whether it's contrails, whether it's spraying particles in the atmosphere, all these different techniques are being used to manipulate the public to say that there's a global warming problem. The Hegelian dialectic says that in order to create this major change, you need to have a problem and then a solution. Climate change is the crisis. The solution is sustainable development, implementation of sustainable development worldwide. The main goal of climate change is to bring about the state of sustainable development. That's the United Nations' own agenda. Climate change whether real or invented, is the perfect vehicle that allows for the implementation of United Nations Agenda 21 Sustainable Development. This is the United Nations plan to make the Framework Convention on Climate Change legally binding on the nations that agree to it. The United Nations has stated many times that this is a global agenda. They've had their consensus meetings around the world and everybody has bought in. It's the blueprint to inventory and control all land, all water, all minerals, all plants, all animals, all construction, all means of production, and all human beings in the world. The United Nations has pointed about this themselves on how the capitalistic system that has ruled for the last 150 years is going to be completely changed, transformed, they say into this new green economy that will be based and regulated on energy and resources. The United Nations itself claims that implementing all the climate change policies and the things related to starting up on sustainable development is gonna cost some $90 trillion. When you consider the magnitude of the money that's going to flow because of what the United Nations is doing, You've got to follow the money and look on the other side to see who's going to receive that money. We have a huge economic transfer of industry into this new green industry. And these are not going to be, well, I want to get involved with this industry. It's going to be a dictatorial industry. It's going to be corporations literally demanding what we do. The money's not going to go to the people. The money is going to go to the corporations that are sitting out there with these giant nets ready to capture the money flow. This is a transfer of wealth. It's a consolidation of wealth. This is much bigger than the American Revolution. This is much bigger than the European Union. This is not just a little bit of money. This is the biggest planned transfer of monetary and political power in the history of the planet. They get people emotionally involved. They manipulate them to support the things that they want them to support. What the goal is, is to create this concept that humanity itself is the enemy. It seems pretty clear that no nation, however powerful, is in a position to do these things unilaterally on its own. So it's going to have to be an international decision capability. When you start thinking about deployment decisions that potentially have profound impacts on countries' well-beings, you're probably going to end up back in the UN and the Security Council and things like that. The actual practical constraints necessary for any actor to achieve a sustained, non-trivial deflection of global climate require more than just the money and the technological savvy. It requires something like the command of territory, the world stature, and the military force to prevail against a bunch of other powerful nations who want to make you stop. In contrast to stuff like mitigation efforts, geoengineering isn't just a single country issue. Um, if one country decides to pursue this, it's going to affect the whole world. So that raises some sort of novel governance challenges that aren't present for a lot of the other uh, aspects of climate change. 
the problem being global suggests that the solution has to be global as well. So you cannot control the weather of the planet by passing an ordinance in Detroit, for example. It will be very difficult for any country to preserve that contamination within its own borders because it is a global treaty. You have to do it at the national level, which might take care of a continent, but ideally it goes eventually to international ordinances and controls and regulations and taxes and all that sort of thing. The Trilateral Commission claimed that they're going to create a new international economic order. When you talk about creating a new system, it's presupposed that there has to be some type of a governance mechanism around it to control it. It's over 193 nations that are getting together, and what they're working towards is forming a new unelected government body. What this unelected government body will do, it will completely circumvent constitutions and state laws. It will create and allow an unelected body, the IPCC, the United Nations, to micromanage our lives through taxation, without representation, various mandates. The United Nations will now implement a full court press on a global basis to bring every country into alignment, to coerce them into changing policies within their country. This is what it's all about. Back in the year 2000, we had the Kyoto Climate Agreement, which was put forth as a treaty. Congress blocked the actual Kyoto Treaty because it was a treaty. In the most recent climate change discussions, the Obama administration has taken an opposite tact and said, don't make it a treaty. Don't put that language in it to where I have to go back to Congress and ask them permission to go ahead with this. He doesn't want to deal with the Senate, which normally has the constitutional responsibility to negotiate and authorize. It also has the implications that you can change the agreement down the road to say anything you want. <laughs> This is another problem with the whole climate change thing right now is it hasn't been clearly defined. Where it's going to be legally binding is in an unexpected area. Between the TPP and the TTIP, it's called TTIP, these agreements are developed by the same people that are pushing the United Nations to create sustainable development. So we find the language of sustainable development buried within the TPP document. The TPP document is legally binding. So backdoor. We're talking about money and power. We're looking at the prize of power beyond anything that's conceivable to those of us who are just individuals. So yes, money and power, but it's far greater than just plain greed. Because what this is about is a mega corporate plan that is totalitarian. It's about mega corporations being able to actually have what a mega corporation wants, which is no world boundaries, total harmonization of laws. They're in the process of creating global corporate tribunals, tribunals that are formed by corporations. And these tribunals will be able to sue local municipalities. An example of that would be, let's say if you're the state of California and you form legislation to ban geoengineering. What these trade agreements give through the tribunals, it gives the corporations the ability to sue states, local municipalities that create laws that might interfere with the profitability of corporations. So it literally removes the power and ability of our legislators to represent their people and it also puts them in a legal bind. We came together around the strong agreement the world needed. President Obama has a free ride to do what he wants to do vis-a-vis -vis the, the Paris Climate Summit conference, the outcome of that summit. He, he can come back and start creating executive orders that have nothing to do with Congress and completely skirt the congressional process. This is what sovereignty is, is having the individual have a voice in what it is that happens to him or her. This is what representative government is all about. When you lose representative government, you lose personal sovereignty. And ultimately, with world governance, each individual nation will lose its sovereignty. This is what globalization means. It's the standardization of all systems, harmonization of all laws in order to implement world governance. 
the required international response looks like something somewhere between a renewed great power diplomacy with negotiations among a dozen states and a universal UN decision making body. United Nations Agenda 21 is predicated on the loss of independence and the loss of ability to be sovereign, whether it's personal sovereignty or national sovereignty. The Obama administration announced that a UN police force would be coming to the United States. These are United Nations climate objectives. And when that police force comes, they're not coming to protect our constitutional rights. They're talking about removing our freedom of speech because right now they're calling climate change a national security threat. They're coming to mandate, they're coming to police and make sure that we adhere to this new government. Are we to assume that these politicians that we know have a lot of ethical problems are so good and so clean and pure that they're going to tell us how to run our lives? Do we really want those kinds of people telling us what we should and should not do? And the answer, of course, is no. There are a lot of implications. And again, people think they're doing something good because this has been sold to them by the corporate mainstream media who has a vested interest in this entire consolidation of government. This is world government. One of the things they're worried about is what you might call a carbon dictatorship, some kind of system where there's a very stringent top-down regulation of emission standards where uh, the government, um, either at a state level, a national level, or an international level, is coming in and enforcing emissions caps or prices on carbon emissions uh, and telling individual firms or individual consumers exactly how much they're entitled to emit. Everything right now, predominantly, that we utilize in terms of energy is based on carbon, whether it's the lights that you use in your home or driving your car. Carbon credits are literally what you buy to be able to exist and live and breathe. And this new thing about commoditizing carbon is a very big deal. It's immense. The amount of money that it's going to extract from companies or also create new money because of new innovations of new carbon trading, that's a new business that's never been there before. In order to know how much to charge you for your use of carbon, you have to monitor, you have to track, you have to assess, and you have to rate. This is part of Agenda 21, is monitoring, tracking, assessment, and rating of every aspect of your life. Today we have these things that are called smart meters, which are meters that regulate and have the ability to determine what appliances we're using in our home, when we're using these appliances. Many people have thought, well, the smart meters sound like a good idea. After all, it's got the word smart attached to it. And smart is good, right? That's the depth of some thinking. A smart meter is really just the attachment that goes on an outside of a home or a business a two-way transmission device that ties into the larger smart grid plans that are being built out across the world. Well, now we find out that, boy, they've got plans to turn on your refrigerator, turn it off, adjust the temperature in your house. They'll be able to know when you're home, when you're not at home. It's all being tied into a centralized, computerized system. They'll pick you up when you leave your home and your lights go off, garage door went open. Ah, oh, he's leaving the house, to close it down. Now they switch to your automobile and they monitor you as you drive down the street. and. This is where it's headed if we don't stop it. The heartbeat of sustainable development is the heartbeat of Agenda 21, micromanagement of people. We might worry, how low can we go? Are we willing to consider, say, carbon dictatorships where most of humanity live in a terrible slave-like situation, or do we draw lines at some point? You want a barbecue with charcoal on Sunday? No, you can't do that. You want to go on a flight to Europe or something and you've been bad otherwise in your carbon footprint? You can't do that. The government is already uh, cooking up schemes in Oregon to tax people by the mile by putting a GPS device in their car. And they're going to send a bill at the end of a period and say, you owe this much for how much you traveled. They'll calculate a bill for you, just for you. The plan was much bigger than that from the very beginning. And the plan was to give central control, somebody sitting in a central location, the power to control your energy consumption inside your own home, to take away that privilege from you. In the name of society, of course, in the name of saving the planet. 
appliances are very important to this. So we're looking at a whole new green economy. So there are a lot of corporations who benefit from this. So let's say you utilize the vacuum cleaner that you use or maybe purchased back in 2010 and it wasn't regulated or deemed to be green. Through the smart meters, they have the ability to know what appliances you're using. You might get fined in your home. You could get a $200 fine from using this and be forced into buying a new product. A friend of mine who was living in Switzerland a few years ago went in to wash her clothes and the thing was like cranking away and the washer was full of water and it stopped. So she was very concerned and she called the repair people and the guy laughed. Utility shut your washer off, it'll be okay after midnight. The effect that it's going to have on you is how much you can use and where you can go and how you can live. Can you drive a private vehicle or are you dependent on public transportation? We would have literally an economic scientific dictatorship telling us what we could and couldn't consume. Where we can live, how we can drive, how many children we can have. The problem with that kind of a scenario is not just the fines that could be levied. I mean, that's bad enough to, to be charged $400 fine because you left a light bulb on when you went on vacation and they know it because they read your smart meter. That's bad enough, but it's the idea that they're tracking you in the first place. It's the idea that you've lost your privacy. It's the idea that you've lost your sovereignty over your own life. When the government comes and tells me or puts up a, a system of punishment and rewards, that forces me into that mold, I've lost rights. I've lost wealth. I've lost the ability to choose. This is Big Brother on steroids. Every single appliance that you have in your house will eventually, in a smart grid, have an antenna that's embedded into it that will transmit your usage data to a smart meter on the outside of your home that will then transmit your usage data to another tower receiving that usage signal that will then go to the utility company for supposedly billing purposes. If we allow these climate agreements to go through, we're all going to have to be capped unless related to cap and trade, you have money and you're able to trade, meaning purchase carbon credits. The new economy is carbon credits, carbon trading, cap and trade. It will be determined whether you yourself are a benefit to the planet or a drain on the planet. And this is how control monitoring, tracking, assessment, and rating for carbon is going to be implemented. Today's cap and trade scheme is a forerunner, at least, to creating a system of actual carbon currency that will be used for purchasing and selling. Cap and trade came into effect in California. We have people now traveling. It's the very beginning of this transfer of wealth, this taxation process, but right now people are paying a fuel tax. There are millions of dollars of damages that are being passed on to the consumer. It's the people in the middle that are being push down into that bottom end that are going to pay for all of this. It just means that the middle class is being destroyed. And soon, if we keep this up, there will be no middle class at all. We'll be back to the Middle Ages again, where you've got the ruling elite and you've got the serfs. That's where they're headed with all of this. To commoditize carbon is, is a new billion dollar business. The winners and losers of cap and trade uh, on the forefront, obviously, is uh, the one government control without borders, because this is global, so it's a way of centralizing control. The winners obviously are the governments around the globe, because obviously this is a new revenue source for them. I'm taxing dirty emission factory for where I wasn't able to do it before, now I can through legislation. So now they have to pay me. And how many of these credits do I issue? I don't know, how much money do I need? I mean, there's some accountability that needs to be there, but who's really accountable if the governments are doing it? There is really no balance of power there. So the governments around the globe are by far the largest beneficiaries monetarily. Now they'll claim that humanity is winning because they're cleaning the air or the CO2 emissions aren't growing at an excessive rate. But uh, obviously the governments are the clear winner and the large energy companies are a winner. On the forefront, it looks like a tax to their profits, but in reality, it's a whole new marketplace for them to exploit. Now derivatives markets are structured for them to hedge their profitability, of course. And where people don't understand is these oil companies hedge their product. They're the producer. 
they know where the price can be set at in terms of their profitability. They can hedge years down the road. So that whether the market for oil goes up to 150 or goes down to 50, they're gonna make money regardless because they're either gonna make money as the oil price rises through extra profits through the price of the oil, or if oil goes lower, their derivatives will make money. So they really don't care if whether the market goes up or down. climate is always changing. It always has changed. It always will change. The question is to what extent humans are influencing the change. They said, no more time for debate. Let's get on with solving the problem. Let's have the carbon tax and let's give us the control. Forget the debate. Science is settled. Well, it turns out that it's not even close to settled. There's no consensus at all. The fact is, over the last several years, there have been scandal after scandal on the misuse and mismanagement of climate data, even by itself with this level of fraud, should throw the whole case out. I took it upon myself to start investigating a lot of areas outside my traditional research topics, like the attribution of 20th century climate change and climate sensitivity, and found that I could not support the conclusions from the IPCC. The government-funded scientific community all pretty much march in lockstep. They don't criticize each other. They do what is popular because that's what gets them funding. The price that you pay in terms of your career for speaking out is really rather huge in terms of it's hard to get government grants and get your papers through peer review. Advancements into administration positions is pretty much precluded. You're ignored in terms of professional recognition, in terms of awards and things like that. So you pay a very big price. And academic scientists aren't going to pay that kind of price for a small amount of funding. And there was a lot of bullying and interference with the peer review process, violation of the protocols established by the ICC, attempts to get journal editors fired. And then I started learning more about the IPCC and all the politicization that had gone on throughout the history. I go, whoa, okay. Then I said, why have I been defending the IPCC and trusting their conclusions over my own judgment? The Our Common Future Climate Change Conference in Paris was a precursor to COP21, also known as the Paris Climate Agreement. What it did, it created the framework to legalize geoengineering and other climate legislation and mandates. Limiting warming to 2C will be a difficult challenge. Reaching it will require rethinking, reinventing many aspects of energy systems, relationships, and lifestyles. What are the strategies, let's say, for local municipalities that perhaps might not want to sign onto any agreements or might be resistant to any uh, planned adaptations? Can anyone speak to that? Um, to summarize my question, I guess it would be the you know transformation at the local level and what, what if there are certain municipalities who would be resistant? They have to deal with their currentness and uh, they're not only the first responders, but at the municipal level, um, they are also uh, the ones that could be then, you know, sued. With implementation, is it possible to maintain the sovereignty of nations? And what are the risks in terms of forming what some critics are calling a, a carbon dictatorship? What we see is increasingly that the decision makers in cities in that case, they want to learn from each other. And oftentimes what's, happen what's happening at global or even national government scale is too slow for them. They say, we, need, we, have, a, we have a problem and we need to... Nobody had a straight so, answer to our questions. They were totally skirting the issues. Why don't we save the following questions for the general discussion at the end. Sorry about that. We need to move on to the next speaker. Have you done any research and published on the tipping points that this is doing and will cause in the future? As I've said publicly and in the literature, I, I'm now of the view that the risks posed by large-scale attempts to reflect sunlight back to space are far outweigh the potential benefits. In terms of jet stream manipulation, what kind of impact would that have in terms of regional variability of temperature? Um, if anybody could speak to that, that would be appreciated. Okay. Let's, let's try 
In 2010, the World Meteorological Organization released a report which uh, listed 42 countries engaged in full-time weather modification activities. This list is just from the US alone. It's very extensive, it would take all day to go through. I just want to highlight one particular program. It was carried out by Division V Cloud Seeding. The area covered in this particular program was 184,000 square miles in volume. Now the IPCC does not list any mention of weather modification in any of its reports. It's all just blamed on human activity. For that reason, I would consider all of those reports to be null and void. With all of these weather modification programs taking place, how would you determine whether that event was caused by nature or whether it was caused by climate intervention? So your question is a very good one, and scientists have to be, weather well, and climate scientists, are very careful about attribution. Scientifically, very challenging. He agreed. They actually did leave out geoengineering weather modification. Sorry, he said what? He, Say he that again. He acknowledged that the IPCC. Okay, he has acknowledged that. Yeah. Left out the weather modification programs because it's too hard to quantify. Yes. In my opinion, that's not a good excuse because yeah. the decisions that are being made, not taking that into consideration, nullifies the IPCC. So he's basically report. saying that it's. It, there's, there's so much climate intervention going on that it's just impossible to monitor what's natural and what's not natural, really. I'm sure that's one of the points. That's going back to the two degree temperature change, given the variables that we discussed today of various climate forces, including the detonation of nuclear bombs, which obviously creates an immense amount of heat, what does that mean in terms of future projections? And why is that not being included in various climate models? Everything we're seeing in terms of climate change policy is predicated on climate models that source CO2 as being the cause of our climate change. I cannot give you the accurate assessment of that, how much is being contributed by CO2, how much the contribution of the black carbon. It still needs to be investigated. When we talk about the emission and reducing the emissions and how to reduce the black carbon generated out of the jet island should be considered to be taken into account properly. If you don't include that at all in the climate change modeling, so I'm quite sure that the models will not be accurate. So far, I haven't seen a single climate change model that included geoengineering. What it means to the models is that the models are inadequate to explain what's happening in the atmosphere. If the data going into a climate change model is flawed, everything downline from that is flawed as well. Climate agreements are meaningless if it's based on phony science. If you were to look at it and factor in all of the important factors, you would factor in the actual geoengineering that's been accomplished to date, stuff that's been sprayed in the atmosphere. So let's say if you're in your house and you turn up the heater, would it be wise to say, oh my God, it's getting hot outside. If you turn the heater on up to, let's say 100, it could be getting hot outside could be getting cold outside. Until you turn that heater off and the heater being geoengineering, you can't determine really what's going on outside. If you had a climate model that incorporated all these different things into it, I don't think you would come anywhere close to what the United Nations is relying on as settled science. Ongoing geoengineering programs are the cause of most, if not all, the changes that we're seeing. And any climate model that is not including the ongoing geoengineering programs without question is flawed at best, fraudulent at the very worst. The spit out conclusions, X, Y, and Z, therefore you need to do A, B, and C. Completely bogus, but it works for them. To make any judgment based upon those models would be just deceit and fraud. The Paris summit in December of 2015 made specific provision to legitimatize geoengineering. There are 193 nations that have signed up as far away as the islands of Tonga. These climate agreements They've created the framework to legalize geoengineering without our input or without the input of our legislators. They will now have the teeth to push through anything they want with any nation, anywhere. Now the moral restraint has been removed, if you will, by the United Nations to open the door for legitimate, fully in the open, 
geoengineering projects. This is literally the biggest issue in the history of the planet. We have enough people to move forward, to come together collectively, and the first step is this. It's our aerosol collection project, which we're going to expand around the world. And going up, collecting air samples, will give us the data to bring positive test results in the courts around the world. And when we do that, we have the ability to get cord injunctions, proving that climate models are incorrect, that geoengineering has been ongoing and has been a major factor in climate change. And the very people that support climate legislation, if we demand that all climate talks, legislation and mandates are rescinded, that your whole agenda is stopped until geoengineering is stopped, it literally forces them into an area where they support our agenda and we can work collectively in restoring our planet. Scientific dictatorship is where this is headed. If you control the weather, you control the world. It's as simple as that. When you play with nature, you can't guarantee the result. Our entire planet is in jeopardy. We'll have greater droughts, we'll have greater floods, we'll have massive variations in temperatures. Geoengineering is a threat, and geoengineering is the key to understanding climate change. And to stop climate change, we have to stop geoengineering. The weather belongs to planet Earth and to all of its inhabitants. Do we want to give somebody who we didn't elect the power to spray toxins on us? People ultimately have to control their own destinies. And when they start doing that, when they realize that, hey, you don't have to accept the fact that they're spraying poisons on you. You can do something about it and start taking back the element of humanity that's been slowly being withdrawn from us. We can take back our freedom. We can take back our nations, nations that our ancestors died for, for the freedom that we're experiencing. We have to start asking some questions and we have to stop listening without questioning all these so-called experts. Once our air is clean, then we can determine what our planet is doing. Until then, it's literally impossible, no question about this, to determine whether the planet's warming or cooling. We're not gonna shut down this program until the geoengineering ends. We need to realize that this small group of criminal elites are counting on misinforming us and us believing their misinformation. They are counting on us believing their lies. How do you fight the rich and the powerful? We can merge together to fight for the future. This is the time to join hands for a better life and a healthier life for our kids, for our families. Our children have a right to live free. They have a right to enjoy life. They have a right to enjoy abundance. We have tremendous power and we can change the entire paradigm. But it takes people knowing about it. It takes people occupying their sovereignty. It's gotta happen. It's the only way we're gonna end this and that this planet will get her breath back. The future is depending on what we're doing today. It's up to you. This is what we can do together. Regardless of where you live, how you live, who you are, you are a human being. It's about a preservance of our planet Earth for all of us and for our children. We can, as humanity, collectively come together. We need people who are aware, but then knowledge isn't enough because we need action. Go to our website, unconventionalgray.com to learn how you can get involved with our worldwide call to action, which includes getting tested for heavy metals and other geoengineering related contaminants. Support our aerosol collection project, which includes taking airplanes into aerosols for the purpose of obtaining court admissible evidence and proving that geoengineering programs are occurring and are changing our climate. Become active in our efforts to bring legal action around the world in stopping geoengineering. Organize a screening in your community. Order a DVD. Make copies and hand out for free to get your community involved in our efforts to save humanity and our planet. And always remember, keep looking up.